mice are everywhere. So uh, I'm quite sure that we we have no like clean, <laughs> totally 100% clean colony. Uh, we, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. If you did not treat and manage, how long would it take for that colony to die from trophallelaps? Maybe one, one month. month. One month. One month. Yeah. If we don't have honeybees for pollination, we're in trouble. They're like a big bank that can't afford to fail. Because if the beekeeping industry collapses, food security is going to start meaning something to people. Another mite would be a, a bomb that a lot of us would not be able to survive. Tropolalaps is a very small external parasitic mite of honeybees. Tropolalaps are just like Varroa, feeding on the bees and damaging the bees, exerting a, a cost to the bees. Tropolalaps can vector viruses just like Varroa destructor mite. These viruses cause just tremendous harm to the bees. Beekeepers battle the Varroa mite every day, and the news coming in about Tropolalaps is even more scary. Bigger losses, the mites reproduce faster. In terms of the beekeeper, a lot of them are very reliant on pollination services, and I think that if they weren't able to make it into the almonds or some of those other crops, it would be absolutely detrimental. If Tropolalaps comes, pollination is gonna be really tough, and of course, honey production is gonna go down. That's gonna be a huge impact economically across the United States. I remember exactly where I was when I saw my first varroa in my first beehive. In that moment, there was that clarity of things have changed and things are going to become difficult. And they did. Varroa mites have had a really severe impact on the U.S. beekeeping industry. If tropolalaps mites ever got to the U.S., there's also huge potential for damage. When varroa arrived in the U.S. Beekeepers were not prepared at all. Nobody was looking for it. Nobody knew what to do. We had no experience with it. We didn't know what was effective. We didn't know the treatments. And the industry experienced an upheaval. They weren't prepared to try and stop the spread. We need to do whatever we can to slow this beast down. And we're scared. It used to take 10 years for something to get off a bee from the East Coast to the West Coast. Now it takes six months. We've got the super highways. There's not a thing in the world that hasn't been spread worldwide since we started all of this as humankind. The mite is potentially spreading to new areas and it's becoming of greater concern. We always felt it would be confined to Southeast Asia, but in the past 20 or so years, it started to expand into colder regions. It's starting to expand more into areas where we wouldn't have predicted it would have been a problem. We are kind of stumped right now as to how the mite is able to persist in these environments that previously we thought that they wouldn't be able to survive in. Why is it suddenly now becoming so much more efficient at getting to new areas? The other big question is how is it surviving so well in these temperate climates? That they are not in the United States yet, yet. I personally want to tell you that I feel like at some point they will be here. We've had Conex containers come in with Africanized bees in them, live. Those made it all the way to Tennessee without being detected. So it's possible that a colony of Amos mellifera from over here could get in one of those Connex containers, survive the trip over, get put on a truck, get shipped anywhere in the United States. Can it be imported on a bee package? Because we do import packages from different countries across the world into Canada. All it really takes is one mite. A lot of our hives go up for honey production right on the border of Canada. Tropolet laps just like Varroa, will not respect that border. The relationship that we have with the U.S. right now is particularly important. We import up to 280,000 queens a year from California and Hawaii, so that relationship cannot be understated. Canada is a partner that we need and we want. We have something in common that we should be combating, and that's tropolalaps. It didn't take long from the first discoveries in Florida and Wisconsin, and two years later, Varroa was virtually ubiquitous in America. 
by the time I find it in North Dakota, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult or impossible to control. One of the most important vehicles is apiary inspectors. They will be, if they are not now, acutely focused on tropal alips and the consequences of it. In the context of bees and agriculture, what we do as apiary inspectors is absolutely vital to the industry. We serve in a role that provides a support system to beekeepers so they can make the best decisions in managing their bees' health. And in that role, we also are able to ensure that regulatory authority capacity is met. This pest coming in is new and it's kind of scary. And as inspectors, we didn't know what to look for. We didn't know what to expect. And the beekeepers also didn't. They are looking to us for answers on some of that. PAM has been really great help, first off, because they organized that meeting at the American Beekeeping Federation to talk about tropolalapse and the threat it might have and just how important it actually is to really expose the frontline bee inspectors to this mite. As a board member of PAM, we said, yes, we need to do this. Let's put together this team, which includes Canadian representation, U.S. representation, bee inspectors. Let's send them over and foot the bill on that because we need to be proactive. The goal is to talk about a unified response because what the United States gets, Canada's going to get. And if Tropy were found, having the research side and the beekeeper side and then the apiary inspectors will give us the best outcome of control and hope of eradicating tropal elapse in the early stages. The research that Dan and Rogan and Jeff are doing, Samuel Ramsey, all these individuals are doing cannot be understated. The work that they're doing, I think, is going to be imperative to helping us with early detection and maybe providing preventing the importation in the first place. Research is really driving knowledge gain as well as technology development, so that's where I hope some of our efforts are helping learn more about the mite, learn how we can monitor cultural and chemical control, and hopefully we can change that knowledge gain in, into practice. One of the biggest things that the apiary inspectors can bring to us is their feedback to us on what they want research, but also what they think is actually doable out in the field setting. In the field, when you're holding a frame and the light's not perfect and you have bees covering the frame, it's not as easy to see that mite running around. So it's going to be difficult for beekeepers and for inspectors to see that. And the monitoring methods that we used here to look at the mites, all of them had issues. And I'm hoping we can come up with something better that isn't gonna rely on us visually seeing the mite that will be able to pick up its DNA without having to spot it in the field. Eight, nine, 10. It's a little bit of gold color to it. So it's picked up a little bit of material. Something that's lacking with tropolalapse is a sensitive and scalable monitoring method and collecting samples to be analyzed for DNA is potentially quite a scalable mechanism. You can take a sample rapidly, send those to the lab, and many samples can be processed quickly. And the hope is that at least one of these sample types will be really good at picking up tropolalapse DNA even at fairly low brood infestation levels which is what you would see during the early parts of a tropolalapse incursion. It is important for U.S. beekeepers and just people in general to understand what Thai beekeepers are doing. After honey harvesting, he uh, controlled the mite by mechanical control. They're the ones that have been having to deal with this mite for an extended period of time. Yes, but trophy on that trophy. Yes. I think the most important thing there on triple A lapse management from both Thai beekeepers and the Asian honeybee species is the brood breaks. The Asian honeybee species, they get too many triple A laps, they abscond from where they are, they go in somewhere else and they start their new home. And with the Thai beekeepers, they're taking brood out. They're doing brood breaks, they're making splits. It is very important to work together because this scientific information is very important for the beekeepers to help them to solve some problem. And we learn some from beekeepers too. If triple A lapse arrives right now, we are really not prepared. We don't have a plan in place. We don't have management suggestions in place. How do we live with it? What do we do? Project APSM funding this workshop in Thailand to study tropolalapse mites, which are not even in the U.S. yet, takes a sign of courage and forethought. 
We may not be ready, but we've got the building blocks here to get ready. And you've got people now that are leaders in the apicultural world for inspection, and also our beekeeper that joined us on this tour that can translate this information, this experience, and really spread that information. We're working on methods to detect them more accurately and working on management strategies. So we're hoping to have more tools in the beekeeper's toolkit if the mite actually makes it to North America. The longer we can prepare at least enough that we can keep the beekeeping industry from total collapse, the better.